Coming up, I'll be speaking with Ellen Brown, former campaign coordinator for the St. Paul Better Ballot Campaign. That's next on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm John Forty. With me today is Ellen Brown, former campaign coordinator for the St. Paul Better Ballot Campaign. Welcome, Ellen. Thanks, John. Nice How to be here. How did you get to St. Paul? You didn't grow up here. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Southern Virginia, where I had never felt below zero temperature. In fact, I probably hadn't felt below about 20. And I moved here in an April, and it snowed the day my furniture <laughs> arrived. So Welcome. I was really wondering what I had done. And how long ago was that? Uh, early 70s, 1971. Okay. Yeah, I was okay. transferred out here with my job. Okay. And through the 70s and 80s, how did you occupy your time? I did a lot of really different things. I was transferred with IBM. Mm -hmm. I sold computers for them first here. Back when they were huge. Back when they were huge. They were. Right, exactly. And the state of Minnesota was my customer. And I you know, got to know the different agencies and ended up working for the then Minnesota Highway Department and ultimately MnDOT. Then I went to uh, private industry for about a dozen years, and since 91, I've been on my own doing consulting of various kinds. I had a small business um, in the travel area, and then um, kind of have been slowing down a little bit, but always increasing my volunteer involvement, which is what this experience has been. Okay. Well, we're here to talk about ranked choice voting. Right. And it so often happens in this show. Ten seconds before air, the guest says something very casual that is really valuable. And that is the difference between uh, IRV and RCV. IRV means what? Instant runoff uh, voting. voting. Okay. And RCV means ranked choice voting. And they're really the same thing. It's just different terminology. Um, for some reason in Minnesota, IRV, or instant runoff voting, had become the terminology that was used the most. And it really, um, in my opinion, isn't the most um, descriptive from the standpoint of the voter. It's really about how the election process works. It's like an instant runoff. Ranked choice voting tells the voter what it's about. It means you get to rank your choices on the ballot. And so gradually, and ranked choice voting is the term that's more used at the national level and other communities and so forth. So we are gradually changing our terminology, trying to change it from instant runoff voting to ranked choice voting. But the election officials still know what to do. They know how to count in ranked choice manner. Exactly. <laughs> okay, in, exactly. In instant runoff manner, yeah. Right. How did it get started in St. Paul? Well, actually, you have to go a little further back than that. In the mid-90s, and that was long before I was involved, there was a small group of people who met around literally a kitchen table in Minneapolis talking about the problems with elections and the way they were run. And they talked apparently about a variety of different reforms that might be pursued and they kind of landed on ranked choice voting as one that they felt addressed some of the key issues with elections in Minnesota. And gradually they started you know, building a grassroots network and talking to more and more people about it. And in 2006 they had it on the ballot in Minneapolis to be used for city elections there. And that year it passed in Minneapolis and about the same time they formed this statewide organization saying what we really need to do, rather than trying to get it passed for state elections right away, we should try to get it implemented in lo the large cities in Minnesota and then have enough of a network of people who've used it and believe in it to be able to take it to state elections. Okay. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of, of actually how it works, let's talk a little bit about what problem it's addressing. What, what, what's the impetus to cause ranked choice voting? Right. The main thing is that to, the way the system works now, too few voters are making really key decisions about who's on the final ballot in an election, or too few voters, well, let's just leave it at that for now, because it, that works either way, whether it's a nonpartisan election like we have in cities in mm -hmm. Minnesota, or a partisan election like we have at the state for state offices like uh, legislature and governor and so forth. In the nonpartisan elections in the cities, there's a primary that weeds out maybe anywhere from three to ten or more 
uh, candidates, and the two who get the highest uh, percent of the vote go on to the general election. Mm -hmm. If there is six or five or eight people on that primary ballot, the person, the two people who go on to the general election may have only been elected with 20 percent or 25 percent at most of the vote. And what's worse, there's a very, very small turnout in primary elections. There might be only five or 10 percent of elected or eligible voters who are even voting in a primary. And then only 25 percent of them may be sending on to the general election the two candidates who win the most votes. So the decisions are being made by a very, very small portion of the electorate. In partisan races, where you have multiple parties, the same thing is happening in the primary. A small number of people vote in the primary and choose which Republican, which Democrat, which Independent, and so forth to put on the general election ballot. And there the problem gets more complicated because there you have multiple people on the general election ballot, one from each party. And as we've seen many times in recent years in state elections, quite often the person who wins has less than 50 percent of the vote. They're not winning with a majority of the mm -hmm. vote. They're winning with a plurality. So now how does it work? Does each party get, there is no primary. Right. Well, this is in nonpartisan races like city elections. So in St. Paul, for city offices only, this does not apply to the school board because school board elections are controlled at the state level. So it only applies to the city council and the mayor. There'll be no primary for those races. And this fall, or yeah, this fall already, we're in January, aren't we? Mm -hmm. In November 2011, there will be no primary for the council seats, which are the ones that are up this year. Anybody who's running for council will appear on the ballot in the general election, and voters will be able to rank the candidates in their order of preference. So if, you, if there are six people running on the ballot, you'll be able to rank all six of them. If there's eight, because of something I can explain later, okay. you'll be able to rank six. But you might only want to rank one. You might know that John is your choice, and I don't want anybody if I can't have John. Fine, rank one. You may only want to rank two, but you, you have the option of ranking up to six candidates. Okay, and if, if your vote for number one isn't the winner, then your vote for number two is counted towards somebody else. Right, so if, so let's say that there's five candidates. Okay. If nobody wins 50% plus one of the votes on the first ballot, so that is a majority mm -hmm. of the votes, then the uh, candidate with the fewest number of votes is dropped. And those ballots are reassigned to the remaining candidates based on the second choice indicated on that ballot. So it's like an instant runoff. But instead of having to go back to the polls to vote again, mm -hmm. it happens instantly. If still no one has a majority of the vote, the, person, the next person with the fewest number of votes is dropped, and those ballots are reassigned. And that continues until there's someone who has a majority of the vote. Okay. Typically happens after two sometimes after three rounds of voting, but rarely would it go beyond that. Okay. And how did this come to be? Now, it, it became law as of the ballot initiative in the most recent election, is that correct? Right. Well, um, let's see. It wasn't the most recent state yeah. election, but the most recent city election, yeah. right. In 2009, we voted on it. At the same time, we voted for mayor. And it passed by about 54 to... 46 percent in that range. And so, and that was an amendment to the charter, the charter for St. Paul and for all, for most of the major cities in, in Minnesota have a charter which guides their operation, including their election process. And so this amended the charter to say that in the future, city elections would be held under this method of ranked choice voting. Okay. And how did that uh, campaign come to be successful. I mean, there, there was a lot of... Hard work. Yeah, hard work. Okay. <laughs> a lot of hard work. It was interesting, in 2006, when it was on the Minneapolis ballot, um, there was a governor's race, there was a Senate race, and a lot of attention being given to those, as well as legislative races and so forth, because Minneapolis elects in even-numbered years. Um, there was very little attention given to the ballot 
amendment, the charter amendment on the Minneapolis ballot that would al allow the implementation of ranked choice voting. And it passed by about two-thirds, 65, 66 percent of the vote in Minneapolis. When we had our election in 2009, in 2009 the only thing on the ballot was the city of St. Paul mayor. There was no um, council. There were no statewide offices. So the only thing that was getting any attention were the mayor's race and the, um, the, the ballot initiative. And so that really drew attention, both media attention and the attention of political people who normally would be involved in other races. Now, did, did the campaign itself get nearly as many votes as, as the mayor, or, or was that something that a lot of people just kind of ignored? I don't remember, okay. to be but honest. But it did pass, I, was it 54? It was about 54 46? to 46. I okay. think it was slightly under 54. I okay. think we had to have 52 in, to pass a charter amendment. You have to have a little more than 50%. Oh, interesting. So, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that until yeah. election <laughs> night. And the results are coming in, and we're you know close to 54. And I'm thinking, great. Well, then I discovered later we had to mm -hmm. have 52. I would have been mm -hmm. much more nervous had mm -hmm. I known. Okay. Tell me about the opposition. What, what's their best argument, in your opinion? What, uh, to be honest, John, I don't get the opposition. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I really don't understand. They say they're worried about it being... Uh, too confusing for people to use. Well, we make ranked choices every day of our lives, whether we're at a restaurant choosing what we want to order or in a video store choosing what video we want to rent. If our choice isn't available, we go to our second choice. We do it all the time. And the other cities that use ranked choice voting have shown very high uh, participation and very high levels of understanding among the very people that the opposition are worried about, which is new immigrants, people who maybe don't have English as a first language, uh, people of lower income, people who maybe don't have as much education. But in the other cities, the data shows that those people are voting successfully and they like the system. So that's one argument that you hear from the opposition. A lot of people who don't really understand what the opposition is about think maybe it's because the people who oppose it know how to work the system the way it is to get their candidates elected, and they're maybe a little nervous about not exactly knowing how this is going to play out. So there's that uh, potential as well. I mean, my immediate first whiff of it is that the power structure is going to think that third and fourth party candidates are going to be more empowered by this. Right. It, so the, there's two different places, again, that you have to think about this. One is for the nonpartisan city, mm -hmm. city races, where there are, is no third party or fourth party. You end up with two people on the general election ballot. You used to when there was a primary. The other is in statewide elections, and you're right. On the statewide election side, where it is primaries, partisan primaries, and they would continue to exist, and then a uh, general election that has individual party people uh, running, it will it will potentially give third party candidates more power. How many times have you spoken to someone who said, "Well, gee, I really wanted to vote for X this year, Tom Horn, or last governor's race, Peter Hutchinson, the one before that, Tim Penny," but I was really afraid if I did that my third choice would win, not just my second choice would win, but the person who I really didn't want would win. We saw that so much. Uh, and you hear that over and over as you talk to people, and third-party candidates report that to us. So there is some sense that third-party candidates, people might feel more emboldened to vote for a third-party candidate if they knew that if that person didn't make the cut, if you will, on the first ballot, that, that the voter's second choice would actually get the vote. So in some ways it could strengthen third parties. But in other ways, it's hard to imagine, given the percent that recent third-party candidates have gotten, that they would get enough votes to make it to the top tier. Okay. In case you're just joining us, this is the St. Paul Forum, and I'm your host, John Forty. With me today is Ellen Brown, former campaign coordinator for the St. Paul Better Ballot Campaign. We're talking about ranked choice voting. Now, Ellen, how has it worked around the country? This has been taking off slowly in other cities, and you said there's some data about how effective it's been. Right. It's actually been used um, for a long time in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I forget how many years, but a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's used in Burlington, Vermont, San Francisco, 
uh, Tacoma Park, Washington, Tacoma Park, Maryland. Um, it has been used in Pierce County, Washington. I'm not sure what the status of that mm -hmm. is right now. There's a number of cities in California that have passed it and it hasn't been used yet. There's no one at the state level using it yet. And that's where in Minnesota, I personally feel the, some of the biggest value will come once we have it at the state level. Let me just say one thing about statewide elections, because we were talking about third parties mm -hmm. earlier in their position. When Jesse Ventura won the governorship in 1998, he had 37% of the vote. So there were, what is that, 63% of Minnesotans who didn't vote for him. Now, some of them, he might have been their second choice. We'll never know that. Yeah. Uh, but 37% isn't much mm -hmm. of a mandate to go in and be governor and try to be successful in negotiating with the legislature and so forth. Yeah. Um, now, with both Minneapolis and St. Paul having approved ranked choice voting, are these the two biggest cities to be implementing it? Um, I don't know where. San Francisco is probably bigger yeah, than St. Yeah, Paul, yeah. at least. I don't know yeah. about Minneapolis. Um, so, yeah, we would be up there okay. with, the, with the largest cities implementing, for okay. sure. All right. Um, tell me more again about, about the opposition. Um, how, how strong were they? I guess that's what I'm going at. I mean, this was a tough fight. And is the, uh, is the opposition ongoing? Well, actually, that's an interesting question. Um, the city council right now is in the process of public hearings and passing the ordinance, which now they have to pass, to spell out specifically how this is going to be implemented. That was my question. Yeah, <laughs> I struggled with that's it a little what bit. you yes. wanted to yeah. ask. <laughs> so um, the um, ordinance spells out how many people will be listed on the ballot, what the process is going to be for counting, and so forth and so on. And the leader of the opposition, when we were doing mm -hmm. the original campaign, is Chuck Repke, whom you probably know, or at least many of your listeners would know, because he's been very active in mm -hmm. city politics for a long time. Mm -hmm. Long time uh, aide to Dave Thune, council member mm -hmm. from the second ward. And in fact, Dave Thune was a leading opponent. Can I say this? Sure. I don't know. It was uh, too late now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, of the ballot mm -hmm. initiative, and Chuck was a leading opponent, and Chuck mm -hmm. really did the groundwork of trying to defeat the... Mm -hmm. And Chuck, to be perfectly honest, is a lot more skilled politician than I ever have been. I've never been involved in a campaign. Mm -hmm. Anything approaching this, I mean, I've door knocked occasionally, but nothing like this, and Chuck is a very skilled political operative. So he really knew how to mobilize people and how to turn out vote and so forth and so mm -hmm. on. And. Uh, but now, with the ordinance in front of the city council, both Dave Thune and Chuck Repke have promised, committed, and both publicly and privately to us, that they want to see it work the way it should work. Oh, because they, yeah, yeah. not to say they like it, yeah. but they want to be sure that, that there's an election that tests it well, and then they can say, look, it didn't work. Let's overthrow yeah. it. So they're not convinced about instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting now, okay. but they are totally with us in terms of implementation. Okay. And that's great. And we expect to uh, involve Chuck and his cadre of people that he worked with in opposing it to help with voter education in St. Paul. I was going to ask next about voter education. How Will there be television commercials? How will the voters come to understand really how to do this? Well, there won't be television commercials okay. because who can yeah. afford that? But uh, we will have extensive voter ed education. We're starting with the, pri with the uh, precinct caucuses on February 8th, I think it is. We'll, be, we'll have um, volunteers at the precinct caucuses with mock ballots talking to people, because certainly the primary or the precinct caucus attendees are very, very likely voters. I mean, that's, you really want to get them. And you also want them to understand it, because a lot of them will be campaigning for candidates. Mm -hmm. They'll be out talking to voters, and we want to be sure that they help voters understand how to use the ballot. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be doing education forums for candidates so that they're, they understand how it works and how to inform their voters to vote. If I'm not your first choice, could I be your second choice kind of thing? Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll just do forums around the, around the city. Hopefully we'll be on this show or other pieces of the St. Paul Neighborhood Network um, to help do education for voters. The city, um, I think, is going to um, uh, set aside $75,000 for voter education, and Fair Vote Minnesota will be going to several foundations asking for money to match that 
to implement, to help implement a citywide voter education program. Okay, good. Um, tell me about the experience of getting it passed in Minneapolis. Well, as I said, there was no opposition because all the attention was elsewhere yeah. on statewide elections. But uh, so it passed with about two thirds of the vote, and then they implemented it. The first year was in 2008, and it passed. Or ex no, excuse me, 2009. What year is this? 2011. A, we just started 11. Yep. We did just Hard start. Hard to believe, 11. isn't it? Anyway, their first use was for mayor and council. And it went ext well, and they have multi-seat elections as well, like park board mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So it was all those races, except for school board in Minneapolis, used ranked choice voting. And it went amazingly well. I think there were six races that ended up going to a second round. And there was only one spoiled ballot in the entire race, in the entire city election. Uh, it was just extremely positive, and there was a lot of feedback. St. Cloud State did a survey afterwards to see what kind of voter reaction there was, and it was very, very positive to the youth. Tell me about who can actually be on the ballot. There's a filing fee, and but there's no limit as to the number of entrants. Is that correct? Right, and that's true now. It has nothing to do with ranked choice voting, and this is something I didn't know until recently. But to get on the ballot in St. Paul, you have to pay either a filing fee, very modest, twenty-five or fifty dollars, mm -hmm. or have a certain number of names on a petition, mm -hmm. which would indicate that you're really serious about mm -hmm. going out and yeah. and working for the seat. And um, so, theoretically, you could have hundreds of people if they wanted to be on the ballot. But typically, you see four or five, maybe six people running uh, for a for a seat. Last year in Minneapolis. For mayor, they had 10 candidates. That was very unusual. Mayor Ryback was an incumbent and uh, won handily, so mm -hmm. it didn't go to a runoff for him. But uh, typically, you see four, five, maybe six candidates running for it. And that would be typically for an open seat. Yeah. But if we were to get, say, 25, 30, 40, it, it'd just be more printing, is that correct? Well, it would be. And um, one of the issues in St. Paul, as it was in Minneapolis, is that the voting machines that we have now don't allow for counting by machine mm -hmm. beyond the first rank. New machines have been certified, and when Ramsey County and Hennepin County replace their voting machines, we anticipate that they'll buy ones that are ranked choice voting compatible. But right now, a ranked choice ballot but will be counted by machine for rank one, and then for any races that have to go to subsequent rounds, they'll be counted by hand. Okay. And um, where was I going with that? I'm not sure. I'm not either. What was your question? The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, what I wanted to get to was the state of Minnesota. Oh, oh yeah. no, wait, excuse okay. me. You were asking about how many, suppose there were 30 or 40 candidates, yes. right? Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. So the city of St. Paul, in passing this ordinance, this implementing ordinance they're having now, because of the hand counting and because of the way the ballot will be laid out as a result of that, they're going to limit the number of rankings to six. It, that won't limit the number of candidates. Mm -hmm. All the candidates mm -hmm. will show, but you can rank six rankings. And originally, our preference, and I think anybody's preference with ranked choice voting would be, well, let people rank as many as there are candidates. Mm -hmm. But in reality, how many people are likely to even rank six? Go beyond six. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how many times do you know that what your seventh mm -hmm. choice mm -hmm. is for your favorite kind of ice cream or whatever? You know, you just don't have a seventh choice. Yeah. And if it should become a chronic uh, situation where 25 or 30 people keep signing up for mayor each year, the council could limit that or raise that bar a little bit without essentially affecting the, the essence of ranked choice voting. That's a small modification. Well, it wouldn't change ranked choice voting at all. It has nothing to do with ranked choice yeah. voting. It would have to do with if they want to increase the filing fee or increase the number of uh -huh. names on a petition to make it just to raise the bar for getting on the ballot, okay. not to raise the bar for how many rankings. I guess my only concern is that it not run to a second page. I'd hate to run and be on page right. two. You know, you just don't have much chance. Right. Well, yeah. Ramsey County um, runs the elections for the city of St. Paul, and Joe Mansky is their elections director, and he's very concerned about designing a ballot that keeps not just all the city council candidates, but mm -hmm. the school board on the front of the ballot. Often in, in statewide elections, you have two sides to the ballot. You often have to turn it over to vote for judges or soil and water conservation or whatever. And Joe is very concerned to be sure that, uh, excuse me, and the drop-off 
and voting on people who are on the back side of the ballot is yeah. quite high. Yeah. Is that because of the races or because it's on the back side? I didn't know who it was on the back side, yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> but uh, the ballot that Joe has mocked up right now for this fall has six rankings and the school board all on the same, all on the front page of the ballot. Okay. So let's talk about the future. Is the state of Minnesota the, the next uh, ambitious goal? We hope so. Okay. That's we, Fair Vote Minnesota, and that's, that's the, the name of the organization is Fair Vote Minnesota. Is it dedicated to changing the state law, or has it just been both city and state? Both. Okay. Both. Um, it was just strategically the Fair Vote Board decided that the best way to attack this was to start at the city level smaller mm -hmm. audience and so mm -hmm. forth and get some experience with using it and show how mm -hmm. it can work. So that was th that strategy. But really, it's expensive to do individual city campaigns and so now our real hope is that we'll be able to build capacity to make this happen at the statewide level. And we were feeling really positive about it before this last turnover in the legislature, but with a Republican majority in the legislature, we think it's unlikely that will make progress this year. The, the Republican Party has not endorsed ranked choice voting at the local or statewide level, unlike the DFL, Independence, Green, and so forth. Okay. Has there been any legal challenges to this? Oh, yes. There have been. Uh, there was a legal challenge when Minneapolis passed it, when Minneapolis first chose to implement it on constitutional grounds. Um, did it violate one person, one vote? And the um, case was heard in the um, district court, and then it skipped the appeals court. You, I didn't know this either until I got into this, but you can actually appeal directly to the Supreme Court in certain instances. And the Minnesota Supreme Court heard the case and decided very decisively with a decision written by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court that it is clearly constitutional. And so that has been set aside as an issue. And, uh, th and in fact, in St. Paul, we waited a year to go on the ballot because we wanted to be sure that the constitutional case was settled and, not, and w that would muddy the situation when it was on the ballot in St. Paul. Okay, Ellen, we have about 90 seconds left. Let's go way beyond your mandate. I know it says Fair Vote Minnesota. How about the rest of the country? Is this taken off? There is a national organization that is um, addressing a number of election reform issues. One is ranked choice voting. Another is the national popular vote. Um, the, there are several other electoral college reform issues and so forth. But um, we are really focusing on Fair Vote Minnesota. We're focusing exclusively on ranked choice voting at this point. And we'd like to have more help nationally, but uh, their uh, mandate, if you will, is a little more muddy than mm -hmm. ours, and so it's not as direct. Mm -hmm. Well, Ellen, thank you very much, and we're going to invite you back to elaborate a little bit more in the future about how to educate the public about how this works. We'd love to do a show to help, it, to help educate people and have the ballot and show you how you market and so forth. That'd be great. Okay. We've been talking about ranked choice voting with Ellen Brown, former campaign coordinator for Better Ballot Campaign St. Paul and a board member of Fair Vote Minnesota. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you, John. You've been watching the St. Paul Forum. See you again next week.